Hey, this is Mike Lindsay from Vital MX. We're out here at Paris MX today with the Alta Motors crew. And I decided I wanted to chat with Derek Dorsine. He is the chief technology officer, one of the co-founders of Alta. And I remember the first time I met you and got to talk to you was all the way back. I think we were talking about this earlier. It was like 2011 or so. Um, AMXO before the, what well, you guys were originally the BRD project that got uh, rebranded here now is, or I, don't know, I guess I'll let you cover that part. However it is, we got to where we are now, but it's interesting. I, I remember seeing the original version you guys were working on, and this is my first time I've actually gotten to spend a full day with him. I got spoiled to ride Darren's for a couple laps one time, but uh, I, I guess the whole thing, other than let's cover real quick, just a, a short background of how we got from where you are 2011 to here, and then we'll dive into some R&D questions. I got a couple things I got to ask you about how you guys made this thing happen. Yeah, um, yeah, we, uh, we, we, we went to AIM Expo in 2011 with a with our very first prototype. Um, the company had been founded the year before um, by myself, uh, Jeff Sand, and Mark Finickstein. And um, we wanted to, to you know, show the world and, and drum up some interest from, from potential uh, dealer partners and distributor partners. And, um, but we didn't really have a product yet. We had, we had a really rough prototype and, and the world was very interested and very excited about what we were doing. Uh, but we had a lot of work ahead of us, so um, we, we came back from that show and, uh, and we really went to work on designing the bike that you see here. Uh, the bike that we showed at the show, it ran, it worked, we still have it, uh, it's, a, it's a relic in our office now. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't producible and it didn't, it didn't really hit the, the performance metrics that, that we felt we needed to hit to be relevant to the market. So, so we, went, we went back to work, and uh, we were still a pretty small team then. There was uh, uh, about six of us that designed uh, the next bike, or at least got it to the point where we had a riding prototype. And, and at that point, um, we were able to, uh, to, to raise capital and really uh, take Alta uh, on the trajectory that, that has brought us here today. Um, we, we raised capital from, from, a, from a number of, uh, of investors, and we grew our team, and we grew our capabilities, and we, we put this, this, this prototype into production. And that's a, that's a, that's a long, hard process, uh, requiring uh, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of sweat, um, but there was a reward. And the reward was that in 2017, we were able to put the Alta Redshift into market, and um, through uh, a, 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 at that time a very small dealer network of just a handful of dealers. Um, and that network has now grown to 45 active dealers across the U.S. Um, we we were able to uh, sell uh, hundreds of the the, the 2017 Alta Redshift MX um, and collect all of that data from and feedback from from customers from racers, from testers, and from our ongoing engineering efforts uh, to do the next things, which are the products we're gonna speak about now. So I guess the most basic point we gotta start, it's an electric motorcycle, so let's talk about the development that went behind the battery pack and the actual motor itself. So I think a lot of people have probably heard by now that the biggest, I guess, upside having an electric motor is 100% torque, uh, pretty much instantaneously. So I would think some people would think of that and go, oh, it's got to pretty much try to loop out when you get on the throttle. And I know from talking to uh, Chris Kiefer, who did a lot of testing with you, just talking a lot, hearing all this about the algorithms and everything you guys have to do to make that power, to pretty much maximize the use of it, to make it rideable, but at the same time maintain the excellent qualities of having an electric motor and having all that torque. So I guess I'm curious about is, I mean, give people an idea, I mean, what, what are we talking about when we say algorithms to create an electric to pretty much, I mean, how much does this thing think per second? How many different variables are like, yeah. is how big of an experience was that to develop? Uh, it's, it was a big effort. Uh, the, yeah. the motorcycle has seven microcontrollers on it, so mm -hmm. seven computers, um, uh, and a lot of software or yeah. firmware that is embedded within those, mm -hmm. those systems that, that include those seven computers. There's, um, uh, there's there's our inverter, which which converts battery energy into um, uh, variable speed, variable torque, uh, motor power, um, mm -hmm. and you know think of that like uh, the the equivalent of the gas machine is is sort of a cross between the ignition and the EFI. Mm -hmm. um, 
and um, no one had ever really built a competitive off-road motorcycle before and so all of the nuances of control that that happen when when bikes are flying when bikes are landing when bikes are in loamy conditions slick conditions great traction when the wheel is slipping all of that stuff really had you know to my knowledge never really been worked out from a controls and software standpoint so uh, what what you're talking about and referring to with the, some of the early testing that we did with guys like Chris Keeper and Dennis Stapleton and and a slew of other people was was to really refine the response of the motorcycle to uh, these myriad conditions that happen in off-road riding and particularly in motocross. It's a very demanding environment. Mm -hmm. So I guess like a couple things I notice I think playing the algorithm is a little bit how it jumps. So initially I think of um, a lack or a low amount of inertia, you know, if a guy rides a four stroke, for instance, people can jump them fairly easily. They kind of, they have a lot of inertia, so they're hard to move around at times, but also, especially say like a 450, you can mess up jumping, it kind of levels out, but it's also hard to move about. Two strokes, of course, are easier to throw about, and then this is its own little level, even lower than that, I guess the inertia is lower than that, so it's even easier to throw around. So one of my first worries would be, oh, if you, I notice when you grab a handful of thrall in the air, the rear wheel does spin up pretty quick on this, so it does drop a little, but it seems like you can't just ring it out midair, it won't just keep going, and little stuff like when you land, it doesn't squirt out from under you. It has this really progressive feel. I think we had talked about right when you touch down, it doesn't give you everything instantaneously on hard pack. It actually allows you to land and get going forward. Not enough that you feel like, uh, like it's gonna throw you off, but enough that it, it lands and it doesn't squirt out from under you really awkwardly. There's like little nuances like that that really are pretty amazing that the thing thinks that much. Yeah, we, um, uh, I mean, if you take a step back, it's, you know, our, our goal is to make a, like an intuitive competitive motocross bike. Yeah. And so it's lap times, it's lap splits. We do tons of back-to-back -back testing with gas bikes. Mm -hmm. And and we're, we're constantly getting that feedback between the, the two different kinds of machines and asking the questions of what would work better in any one condition and refining the, the response of the machine to, to that stuff. So it's all of what you said, how it responds to the air, how it responds when you land. And, and really, um, through looking at data that we get from from the built-in data acquisition system on the bike and, um, and and all of the feedback from the riders we've we've refined that stuff we feel it's a it's a good setting where it is right now so of course the bike because of the way the the motor is and the and the battery the entire mainframe like the swing arm the suspension components wheels body work looks similar but then the subframe to the mainframe is quite a different um, approach I mean where does where does the design draw from? And beyond that, what, what would you say you guys have more time into, the chassis or the algorithm stuff? Uh, I'd say the electronics and the, and the software is, is probably a bigger investment than the chassis. Um, but uh, there's a lot to uh, uh, a good functioning motocross chassis. There's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, flex characteristics that, that are really critical to how the vehicle uh, handles. Um, we approach that by doing a you know huge competitive analysis of other people's bikes and I'm trying to understand you know, what people liked and why they liked them and then try to actually measure those things on other bikes and then incorporate what we thought is the right combination of those characteristics into our design. And our design looks very different, but it actually feels very similar. And, and you know, that's what that approach yielded. So I guess that's the other thing, looking at the frame, uh, one of the biggest difference people might notice is around, above the foot peg area, the different guards, um, the different material and the way the frame wraps up. I look at it, one thought in my mind is I don't want to be critical, but I think, oh, like, that looks a little clunky, that's a little weird, like, what does that feel like? And I think I told you earlier, is, um, standing on this motorcycle in the attack position on the balls of the feet gripping the legs, the contact patch is extremely consistent all the way up the bike, since I guess you guys aren't conforming to I guess what we consider a standard layout. It seems like there's some places you guys are able to almost improve on where you can add and take away material. Yeah, I mean, there's differences, and, and um, you know, you know, our our goal is to make the better bike, and so if it if it if, if you needed a better place to grip, we built it in. Yeah. Um, then moving on to something, of course, it's a little more of a crossover between everything suspension-wise. Yep. You guys are working with WP. Um, I guess you know initially some guys look like okay, it's K10 components. The axle lugs look pretty similar. Some stuff 
like that. Um, compared to when you guys first started to now like what we have with the MXR, the newest version we rode today, um, how involved is your guys' suspension process? Did, did, to put it bluntly, did you guys start with a setting based off, say, a, a KTM? Did, how much involvement does WP have in testing? How much involvement do you guys tear it apart yourself and do settings? Yeah, I mean, WP has been uh, involved in, in the testing and development of the suspension, um, but, but we actually came up with our own internal settings. We've got uh, uh, technicians on hand, uh, led by a principal technician, Dale Lineweaver, who um, you know, our, our veterans of the business, build suspension, shock dyno, fork dyno. I mean, we, we go deep into, into getting stuff that works and do a lot of testing to confirm it. Uh, I guess one real specific question, it's one that's really curious for me, is uh, linkage ratio. Uh, people hear that term and if they could ever actually see a linkage ratio like the, the graphs, the, the four Japanese manufacturers are extremely close. Theirs are just little crossover differences. Yep. Um, and then KTM and Husky are kind of in their own world. You're able to run quite a bit of different spring rate with their system. Um, are you guys, what would you say you're closer to? Did you guys kind of go out on your own really there? Or would you say you've kind of stuck towards that pattern? Or? Um, our linkage ratio isn't gonna, you know, the, the, the shape of the curve's not gonna look really foreign to, mm -hmm. to um, uh, comparisons with the Japanese bikes. Uh, we're certainly, um, uh, not down there with KTM and Husky. Yeah, uh, we're somewhere in between where where, where they are and the Japanese. <laughs> what uh, what suspension wise? Because like one thought I have is the way the bike produces power. Was there any real challenges in keeping the bike squatted and loaded compared to the settings used in a gas bike? Has there been any? Well, I guess when you look at suspension for the bike, is there something that really stands out that you guys had to adapt because of the way this either produces power or the way it loads? Is yeah, I mean it's it's this uh, you know one step forward, two step backs kind of kind of problem. So you know uh, a lot of times at the track we'll address things with with changes to to setup, to suspension, to gear ratios, um, and then we'll think about it a little bit. We'll come up with a way to do something some of that in software, mm -hmm. and then and then we'll do it in software, and then you know roll back some of the changes we did in those settings. Uh, it does require slightly different uh, suspension setup than the gas bike. You're 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 right on on track there. So I guess the last thing, we'll keep this, uh, I could ask you a million questions all day, but yep. I think one of the interesting ones is something you mentioned earlier about you guys internally talking about a roadmap, uh, a plan of expanding the eventual model range, and it was a question I asked you then. So I think what's interesting with this is, you know, let's say you take one of the, the big Japanese or KTM or Husky, you look at their bikes and the, the 250, a 450, a 350, a full size bike looks very comparable across the range. Then when you start going smaller, between bores and strokes and frame designs, the little bikes quite often look a lot different than the big bikes. There's a lot of differences in the way they're designed. With the way you guys have built this package, the way the battery and the motors and all the electronics work, is it, I don't want to call it a simple, but is it easier to look at the bike and go, yeah, we can actually just start downsizing? Is, it, is this design easier to do that with? It's, um, uh, you know, the, all of the core technology that, that this machine is built around, the battery technology, the motor technology, the motor control technology, and the chassis technology are scalable. So we can make sort of downsized versions of them and, and produce a, a broader um, product offering, product, broader sort of list of, of things to address all those different places that, that you know, motorbikes fit into to the mix. Yeah, because ultimately right now you guys have your standard Redshift MX, which is kind of an all-rounder. MXR is very motocross focused. You have yeah. Supermoto, I think a, what, a flat track option or something you played no, around with. No, we played around some flat track, track just as a fun racing thing, but yeah. Supermoto and an Enduro. Yeah, but yeah. all based kind of off this general size, so yeah. down the road we can, I'm not putting it down, but you guys want to eventually expand? We, we absolutely will offer more categories of motorcycles in the future. Yes, yes indeed. Very cool. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you.